Welcome to QX Church. I'm Pastor Scott Conway. You can find us online at qxchurch.org. And this is the, the third in the series about my personal faith. In the first lesson, we talked about my faith as I live it and how my faith in Jesus Christ and how being a Christian affects my day-to-day -day living, affects my personal philosophy, affects my values, affects my judgment, affects my relationships, affects the way I go through the world with love and joy and peace. Last week, we talked about God as I relate to him, talking about my relationship with the Almighty, how I come to God as my creator, I come to God as my king, I come to God as my father, how I recognize God as being all-powerful, being all-present, so he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent, and also omnitemporal, which means that to God, all time is now. That means if there was ever a moment I was sure of God's love, that to God, my very worst moments were also part of that equation, whether they had happened yet or not. And so therefore, I can have confidence that the most certain I have ever been of God's love is true in those moments I am the least certain of God's love. And talked last week about the fact that the existence of Jesus Christ coming into the world as a man. And Jesus telling us, I came not into the world to judge the world, but that through me the world might be saved, and that we know from John 3.16 that God so loved the world, he gave his son, that I have a God who would rather die than judge me. And to me, stuff like that is huge. To me, that means if I'm going to be a godly man, I need to walk in the same level of judgment I discern from God. If I'm going to be a godly man, I walk in love and joy and peace. If I'm going to be a godly man, that whole love thing is pretty specific and pretty powerful. This week, I'm sharing the Bible as I believe it. And it's not a study of the Bible, as has been true for this whole series. It's just me sort of sharing extemporaneously of how I relate to that book. Now, my three founding principles, the, the, the core organizing principles of my life are three. Number one is reality is more important than anything I believe. What that implies then is there is an objective reality and that whatever that objective reality is must be more important to me than my beliefs, which comes with the implication that I acknowledge, therefore, that reality and my beliefs will be at variance. At the very least, I know I will never know it all. That even if everything I knew happened to be perfectly correct, I certainly don't know everything there is to know. The same thing as a lawyer. I might be correct in every bit of law that I know, but does that mean I know every case, every statute, everywhere in the entire planet? Of course not. In fact, when some people will say things like, but, but you're a lawyer, don't you know the law? I'll inv invite them to come with me to a law library. <laughs> Look around at this law library and tell me if they think there's any human being who knows every single thing in that law library. That answer would clearly be no. Well, it's the same thing with the Bible. Nobody knows everything there is to know about the Bible. Come with me to a seminary. Come with me to a Christian library of research books on all theological things and tell me if you think there's any human being on the planet who knows every single thing in all of those seminary libraries. That would be a no. And then if you want to ask me, but, but you're a pastor, don't you know the Bible? It's like, well, if by that... You mean, don't I know that there is a Bible and that there are words in the Bible and that I can find these words? Yes. But as far as knowing everything there is to know about the Bible, there are scholars who devote their entire adult lives to that and that alone who don't know everything. And there are multiple scholars who devote the entire lives to that, focus on the Greek and the Hebrew even, the original languages, and have read scriptures in their original languages multiple times and st 
studied them, broken them out in the original languages, who still disagree with each other over what that means. So, reality is more important than anything I believe. Reminds me that reality and my beliefs may be at variance. And at the very least, my beliefs will be incomplete as compared to what all of reality is. Also flowing from that is the principle, I have a point, you may also have a point. Because I can't know for sure that you are wrong if I don't hear out how you arrived at your position. You may have perfectly valid points to back up your position that I may still disagree with, but me disagreeing with you is different than I'm right, you're wrong. Of course you think you're right. If you didn't think you were right, you wouldn't hold the position. And if I didn't think I was right, I wouldn't hold the position. None of us sits around and go, well, I know this is wrong, but darn it, I believe it. That we hold to our beliefs because we believe that we're right. We believe that they're true. But we always need to be just open-minded enough to understand that if reality is going to be more important than anything we believe, that what reality actually is and what we believe may be at variance. My number two core organizing principle is all principles must be consistently applied. All principles must be consistently applied is number two and a core way of getting to number one. For instance, back to the I have a point, you may also have a point. If we're going to have a discussion and I start off with I'm right, you're wrong, I'm going to convince you that you're wrong. As opposed to, we begin with, well, I have a point. You may also have a point. I would like to learn your point of how you back up your position, and then I'm happy to explain my points of how I back up my position. If I begin with, I'm right, you're wrong, and you begin with, you're right, I'm wrong, we're not having a discussion, we're having a debate. And what gets interesting about that is, to whatever extent the truth might not be entirely encapsulated in one position and one position only, that we're actually fighting from opinion rather than reality. Because if you have arrived at a conclusion different than me, chances are your data set is different than mine. Now it's possible that I know everything that you know and then a whole lot more. That's possible. It's possible that you know a whole lot more than I know. And that one of our positions is based upon everything the other one knows and then sort of the rest of the story. That's possible. That doesn't really happen a whole lot, though. Much more often, one or the other of us sees things differently than the other person sees things, has learned things different than the other person has learned things thinks that the facts are something different than the other one thinks the facts are. And using all principles must be consistently applied. Being able to see things from multiple sides simultaneously lets us be able to interact better and to ascertain reality better. Because in order for me to persuade you, you have to be at least open to the possibility that maybe I'm right. Well, I want that for me, so therefore I should extend that to you. The you know, golden rule 101, right? When I seek to impose a rule based on that principle, that principle must equally apply in the other direction, or it's not really a principle. I have mentioned before, and I don't recall if it's in the lessons, but it was in another talk that I gave for sure, is that I had a gentleman who made the argument to his bosses that his bosses should listen to him because he's closer to the front lines. He knows what's really going on. But then when he was dealing with his subordinates, who were the ones actually on the front line, face-to-face -face with the customers, he said, well, you need to listen to me because I'm your boss. I'm the manager. And so his real rule was, you should just listen to me. Because if the principal really is, I'm closer to the front line, well, then he should listen to his front line people. If the rule really is, I'm the boss, you should listen to me, well, then he should be listening to his bosses. His real rule, everyone should just do what I say. He didn't like that realization, but he was mature enough to understand that's what he was doing. 
And so when you begin to look at the all principles must be consistently applied, you find out what your real principles are, and sometimes that's not pleasant. But when you get practiced at it, as you utter things, as you pass judgment, as you have your relationship with yourself, you begin to see how your self-relationship and your other's relationship rules work on the same rules. That what's a healthy self-relationship and what's a healthy other's relationship is the same kind of relationship. What's a healthy God relationship is the same kind of relationship but what's a healthy people relationship and what's a healthy self-relationship. What should go one way should also go another way. And that the more we understand that, the more we begin to realize how important it is to really get into and refine our principles. How important, fundamentally, the golden rule is, because that's what the golden rule says. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Golden rule 101, right? So therefore, all principles must be consistently applied. If it applies one way, it applies the other way. Silver rule. Do not treat others the way you do not want to be treated. Get another version of all principles must be consistently applied. You don't like it done to you, don't do it to other people. All principles must be consistently applied. If it goes one way, it goes the other way too. And so when you get into all principles must be consistently applied, that helps you ascertain reality. So number one, reality is more important than anything we believe. Number two, all principles must be consistently applied. And the one most relevant to today, the Bible is the undisputed primary source material for Christianity. The Bible is the undisputed primary source material for Christianity. Now, primary source material for anything means this is one of the places you go that's at the top of the list as far as authority on the subject. That's a primary source. Undisputed primary source means that nobody argues that the Bible is not a primary source for Christians. Now, they may have other books that they throw in there. They may make tradition co-equal to Scripture. There's a lot of other things that get mixed up in there, but there is nobody, even atheists, who don't think that the Bible is a Christian book. Even people who don't actually believe the Bible, believe the Bible is the Christian book. People who despise the Bible still think the Bible is the Christian book. So when we say that the Bible is... We're talking about the 66 books of the Protestant Bible. We're not including the Deuterocanonical or Apocryphal, depending upon what your tradition is. Uh, books in the Bible. We're not including the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price. We we're just including the basic 66 books, Old Testament, New Testament, of what most people think of as the Bible. That part is undisputed as the primary source for Christianity. Whatever other people add in, they agree that that's the book. That's the Christian book. The Bible is the <coughs> undisputed primary source material for Christianity. That means if you're going to be dealing with Christians, you can cite the book because it's the Christian book. But if you're dealing with non-Christians who do not acknowledge the Bible as an authority, do you, do you cite not authority in someone's life as authority in someone's life? No. It'd be like if I'm a California attorney, and as a California attorney in the United States of America, I'm going to cite Australian law. Well, that's not going to fly. Or if I go traveling somewhere, and I happen to be in India, and I'm going to you know, lecture some, some person in India about what law is like in California, and that that's how it ought to work. I'm in the wrong jurisdiction. That's not the authority over their lives. The Christian book is the authority in Christian life. Now, can I make a logical argument where I started the Bible, but there's a logic to it that should apply to everybody? Of course. So when I cite, thou shalt not commit murder, I don't know of really hardly anyone who would say, like, oh, we can't have murder laws. That comes from the Bible. That's, that's these religious people trying to impose their morality on us. Well, that's because there, there's a secular logic to having murder be illegal. Same thing with, you know, thou shalt not steal. But it's hard to make a secular argument for keeping the Sabbath. It's hard to make a secular argument for worshiping the Lord thy God and, and you know, making no graven images. That, that's a harder secular argument as it should be applied to everybody. 
And then there's things where there might be ideals, like thou shalt not covet, but are we going to make coveting illegal? Of course not. And but although, you know, there might be an argument to do that. To, to make someone's desire for something to a level where it may be an inappropriate desire illegal, and that we're going to put people in jail, issue them tickets, where you might even look at some of the stuff and think, well, it sounds like a good idea, but how, how would you enforce that? What would the penalty be for breaking that rule? And so some of that becomes a problem when you're trying to take a, a biblical authority and you're going to try to impose it on a society that doesn't acknowledge the Bible as the higher law. So, so it's for Christians. The Bible is the undisputed primary source material for Christians, for Christianity. Now, flowing from that, I also have a personal belief that is held by uh, most conservative Christians that the Bible is the Word of God. That we are told of all Scripture is God-breathed. And that means inspired. That means that in some way, shape, or form, the Holy Spirit guided the writing. Now, for some people, they believe that God has guided the exact words. God has guided the exact books as, as they have been compiled. And that every word, every yacht, every tittle, which, which is like crossing the T, dotting the I's, is there on purpose. And that it's there on purpose, and it's meant to be taken as God's inspired word. And that he selected his authors, and he worked through their own temperaments, personalities, education, and background to draw on them to craft exactly what he wanted. So it's not like God shows up with his own fingers and he's writing it all out with a quill and a pen but that he's specifically inspiring someone for exactly the right words. And so when we say that the Bible is the word of God, we mean that even though the actual writing of the physical words was done by a human being, that behind that human being was the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so therefore these words are not to be taken at the same level as a piece of pop psychology. That you don't treat the Bible the same as, say, one of my books. I, mean, I have a book called The Ohana Way. I've been teaching a series on it. And we're going to be you know, expanding on that idea. It's good stuff. It's not the Bible. And so when people say things like, well, the Bible is just written by men, you say, oh, so, so basically I put as much authority in the Holy Bible as I would put into my copy of The Ohana Way. As I would put into a copy of Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. Or, or is there something different about that book? Is there something we should take maybe a little more seriously about the book? Because when I'm reading a bit of John Gray, there's a whole bunch of it I feel totally free to dismiss. I mean, just because the, the man is a supposed expert doesn't mean that I have to just take his word as, well, it's the word of John Gray. No one disagrees with John Gray. But when it's the Bible, I say, well, it's the Word of God. How much freedom do I give myself to disagree with the Bible as a Christian? Now, there are some Christians that don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. They really do believe the Bible is just, it's a book of ancient wisdom written by some fairly wise guys that we've decided to kind of collect together and, and that one day a bunch of human beings got together and said, well, we like that book and we like that book, oh, but we don't like that, those books over there. And so we're going to keep these books. We're going to get rid of those books. We're going to edit it so it kind of says what we want it to say. And so that way we can kind of back up the authority of the church and, and we can maintain our power structure and, and we can create a patriarchy so that we can get rid of all the mother goddesses. And, and, and there's a lot of people who claim to be Christians who really believe that. And that they treat the Bible as, yeah, it's more guidelines, really. It, it's kind of some vague suggestions. It's an interpretation of history. Yeah, maybe stuff happened. Maybe it didn't. And, and they're somewhat dismissive of the Bible as a religious text. They kind of treat it as a piece of ancient literature. And so they don't really see it as the Word of God. They don't really see it as really having any authority, really. That so they pick and choose the parts that they like and they'll go with the parts that they like, and are pretty dismissive of the rest. I happen to be one of those that believes the Bible is the Word of God. 
And so for me, I can't just dismiss words in the Bible. I can't just dismiss passages. I can't just dismiss books. I can't look at something and say, well, I don't kind of like what that looks like that's leading to, so I'm just going to assume that really wasn't part of Scripture. That, that, that part doesn't really matter. Because then I back up to reality is more important than anything I believe. Well, from where do I get my knowledge about Jesus Christ? Well, from the Bible. Well, the Bible is just a book cobbled together by people. Then there is no Christianity, really. Christianity is just a philosophical belief system, probably very loosely based upon this guy that may or may not have really existed, that said a couple of nice, pretty words. Well, if that's all it is, we could grab anybody who said some nice, pretty words, and anybody that had any kind of a philosophical point of view, and then they all become equal. But my faith in Jesus Christ as a Christian comes from the Bible that tells me that he was God in the flesh. He was the Son of God. And there's a whole bunch of reading and interpretation that you can do to, to see how who he is parallels who the Father is and who the Holy Spirit is again and again and again and again and again. And how the Father gave his Son, how Jesus laid down his own, no one took it from him, he laid it down, he takes it up again. And all of these things are basically telling if there is no resurrection, if Christ did not come back from the dead, then the Bible itself says that Christians are fools. That being a Christian is an idiotic idea if Jesus Christ did not die for our sins. There is no Christianity because there is no forgiveness. Then all you have is some guy that may or may not have existed, at least we're telling stories about this guy, that may or may not have existed, maybe a fictional character, who knows, and, and that he died, okay, no big deal, a whole bunch of people died, or he was crucified, well, no big deal, a whole bunch of people were crucified, but the biggest difference is he came back. Well, how do we know that? Well, we know that from Scripture. Well, if I'm going to pick and choose which parts I believe, well, certainly that's one of the most unbelievable things in Scripture, that a human being who was dead came back to life, and that there's this deal of salvation that he offers us for free, that he was more willing to die for us than he was willing to judge us, and he went through all of this, that's a ridiculous proposition, perhaps more ridiculous than almost anything else in Scripture. And so if we're going to take the Bible as, well, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. Yeah, it's just a bunch of people got together and they wrote some nice stories. That's one of the core parts to throw out. Without which there is no Christianity. Christianity then just becomes kind of a, a philosophy based on fairy tales. So to me, I have to take the Bible seriously. And so when I say I believe the Bible is the Word of God, what I mean is I believe the books in the Bible are the right books. And I believe the words in those books are the right words. Now that said, there's another related belief. Is that the Bible is the word of God. Our interpretation of the Bible is not the word of God. What that basically means is, yes, the, the, the words are the words, but I don't know if they mean what you think they mean. Maybe they mean what you think they mean. Maybe they mean something else. Sometimes the answer just is, I don't know. Yeah, that part's a little confusing. I don't know. I don't get it. And in fact, the fact that there's so many confusing parts in there, there's so many paradoxes to be resolved, to me, is evidence of divine authorship. Because if you have a bunch of people getting together writing pretty human stories and you have a bunch of people getting together and kind of picking and choosing their books and editing it for their own purposes, wouldn't you make it a bit more clear that you get your way and a lot less paradoxical? I think you would. I think the difficulties in Scripture are testament to its divine authorship. Or, alternatively, it's testament to the idiocy of these people who put the book together trying to use it to support religious authority. So that's kind of how I see it. Either God did it, or you had a council of people in Nicaea, or whatever, you know, whichever council people believe or were responsible for collecting and editing the books specifically to support their own power. 
that those people were a bunch of idiots, that they weren't good scholars, they weren't even good politicians, that they included all of these things that undermined their very position. They include all of these confusing things that when you look at it on first blush, it doesn't make sense and you have to dig into it. And it doesn't clearly support their authority. So either these people really weren't very good at it, or there's something else going on here, and I'm in the camp that believes there's something else going on here. Part of my assumption draws from Old Testament prophecy. Because the Jews specifically reject Christ, and the Old Testament was specifically translated into Greek before Christ with the Septuagint. And so we know what the Old Testament scripture said before Jesus was born. And when you read things like in Isaiah, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for an hour iniquity, by his stripes we are healed. That so clearly is talking about Christ so much so that if you read that passage to a Jew, they will think it must come from the New Testament because that sounds like you're talking about that Christian Jesus guy. Even though it comes from their, their part of the book. And that I look at that and go, okay, the people who specifically repudiate Jesus have preserved the book packed with prophecies about Jesus. Well, that kind of tells me there's something going on there. And that either Christianity is Christianity or Christianity is just a philosophy based upon cute fairy tales. Because it claims to be something way more than that. But I also acknowledge that what the scriptures mean isn't the same as what the scriptures are. I can believe the books are the right books and the words are the right words and disagree passionately with people about what those words mean. For instance, there's um, a section of scripture which says God hates divorce. There's a you know, red letter remarks. You read a red letter Bible where they put the words of Jesus in red letters where, where Jesus specifically says God hates divorce. It was never meant to be that way. Well, here's another interesting thing that gets overlooked is we're also told Jesus is divorced. That Israel was his bride. And that God issued a certificate of divorce to Israel. You go, oh, wait. But I thought God said no divorce ever, period. Well, well but the, the spiritual adultery, that's it. So, oh, okay, so... Can I get divorced over spiritual adultery? What does that, what does that mean at the human level? Uh, well, I guess confusing then, doesn't it? And here's where some of that started for me. is I became a Christian in 1983, I think. My goodness, that's been a few years. And so I've, I've, I've been a Christian for a while. But early on in my faith, I was at San Diego State University majoring in criminal justice administration and kind of setting up some graduate study in sociology. And the particular area of study I focused on was violence against women. And so I'm studying you know, rape and domestic violence and I'm kind of going, now wait a second. So, there was a teaching series going on in church at that time, kind of against divorce, and the idea of it is pretty simple, is that there's only two biblical reasons for divorce, and one of them is adultery, and the other one is if a non-believer spouse leaves. And other than that, you're not allowed to get divorced, period. Well, I'm thinking, well, you know, while I'm hearing those messages on Sunday morning, during the week in school, I'm studying all of these very serious domestic violence things. And so, of course, as you can imagine, I go to the pastor, and I, I talk to the pastor. And I said, well, you know, I'm thinking about domestic violence situations, and, you know, clearly that's not adultery, and that's not someone leaving. In fact, they specifically don't want to leave. They want you to stay, and they want to beat you up. So, wh what do we do with that? And what they explain is like, well, yeah, well, technically, Scripture says that it's only adultery and abandonment by a non-believer spouse, that we as a church have a policy of, and, and because it was a safety issue, right? Well, I didn't realize it quite at the time. I kind of took that, kind of, you know, I wasn't 100% sure I, I liked it, but it made sense. 
that of course, you know, as a church, you don't want to lead people in harm's way. What dawned on me afterwards was what they essentially said is, God says, but. And stuff like that kind of gets me going, say, whoa, 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 hang on a second. Okay, so we're a Christian church. We say the Bible is the word of God. And at this church, we say that God says no divorce unless there's adultery or abandonment. And that we acknowledge that abuse is not abandonment and abuse is not adultery. And so if you have a husband-wife situation and they fight a lot, and some of the fights bubble over to being verbally, emotionally abusive, and some of those abusive situations bubble over to being physically violent, or so physically abusive, or even sexually abusive, but what you're saying is the Bible doesn't address that. God doesn't say anything about that. That doesn't qualify, but we're going to qualify it. So you're basically saying, well, God missed this one. It's like, well, you could make that argument. I mean, because if you're trying to like dive into scripture and say, okay, well, what does God say about driving my car? What does God say about being on the computer? What does God say about the internet? It's like, well, okay. That stuff was invented substantially after the Bible was written. And so if, if there were specific admonitions in the Bible about that stuff for like 1,900 years, it wouldn't make any sense to anybody because it didn't apply yet. And so for those things, we have to kind of discern principles and see how those principles apply when the details of technology change. But, you know, I'm pretty sure human beings didn't come up with abusive relationships in the last couple of thousand years. I'm pretty sure human beings being human beings, we probably did stuff like that, likely for the entirety of the human species. So, one of my things like, okay, well in which case, my assumption is, if the Bible is the Word of God, chances are it must not mean what you think it means. Because if you think what it really means is that God sides with the abuser against the victim and is telling the victim the victim has to stay because the victim is not allowed to divorce his or her abuser, that doesn't sound very God stuff to me. That kind of sounds more like, I don't know, a devil thing than a God thing, to me anyway. And so therefore my assumption is if you just read the Bible as, yeah, it's nice literature. Yeah, it's the Word of God, but it's kind of more guidelines, really. We're not really totally bound by it. We, we can kind of add to it, take away from it, kind of because, yeah, things are different now. I have a problem with that. Because it either is the Word of God or it isn't the Word of God. And when you start to make interpretations and say, this is what we say the Word of God says, and then we're going to do something different anyway. I have a problem with that. So now here's part of my view. While it may appear that my conclusions are very liberal, I'm very conservative about the Bible itself. Because my view on interpreting the Bible is if your interpretation requires that the words not be the words, not a good interpretation. So either the interpretation's got to go, or you have to admit that to you, the Bible is not the Word of God. And that you are a higher authority than the Scripture in your church. Because if you're going to say, God says, but, as soon as you get to whatever you put after that comma, but, you're assuming higher authority than Scripture. Which I think is dangerous for Christians because as soon as you do that, well, then anybody can do that, right? All principles must be consistently applied. And so if you get to just dismiss Scripture because there's a part of it you have some trouble with and get to do the opposite of what you say God says, then by all principles must be consistently applied. You just said everybody has the authority to disregard Scripture. Which then therefore means, when you're going to sit down with me and you're going to cite scripture at me as a Christian, I go, but wait a second. You pick and choose and dismiss the parts you don't like. So, 
what gives you the authority then to say, I can't do the same thing? I have a PhD from a seminary. I went to seminary. I know my, my, my Bible. I've read the whole thing cover to cover again and again and again and again and again. I don't even know how many times. 20 times, 50 times, who knows? I, I, I lost count. Sometimes I sped read it. Sometimes I read it out loud. Sometimes I read it in a year. Sometimes I read it in a few weeks. Sometimes I read it over a couple of years. I'm about to start the Geneva Bible. That's a tough one to try to get to in one year. That, 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 that's, yeah, that's probably not going to happen in one year. The last time I think I read the Geneva Bible, it took me I don't know, somewhere between 18 months and two years. The first time I read it, I think it took me longer than two years, because it's a tough read, because it's in 1500s English. Uh, the original Geneva Bible was completed in 1560. They didn't even have standardized spelling yet in 1560. You might find the exact same word spelled different in, like, just a few pages apart. But the words are still the words. The books are still the books. So my belief when I go into Scripture is, if the Bible is the Word of God, then that means whatever interpretation we mean make must say the words get to still be the words. The books still get to be the books. Now, interpretation must in some way, shape, or form harmonize with all of those. Well, as it works out, there's Old Testament scripture that is essentially a case law situation. The long and short of it boils down to, if you break your marriage vows and you don't keep the deal of marriage, your partner doesn't have to put up with that. And in the biggest disparity in authority there is, a man to a woman, a free person to a slave. It said that if this free man, wealthy man, takes a slave woman as his wife, and then he takes a second wife, which was legal under the law then, and adding a second wife, he even just diminishes his performance of his marital obligations to her. She has a right to leave. And so under Old Testament case law, the rule was, if a slave has a right, a free person has the same right. If a woman has a right, a man has the same right. And so if you want to declare a universal right, one of the ways to do that is say a slave woman has this right. And in Old Testament culture, that was the same as saying, this is a universal human right. But if you, here's the funny thing. If you said it was a universal human right, there would be an argument of, well, do they mean universal to all men? Do they mean universal to all, all free people? Do they just mean free men? And there would be this argument about it. But when you say, look, a slave woman has this right, they go, oh, okay, well, I guess that kind of settles it. Because no one was going to make the legal argument that a right went to the slave woman, but not to a free woman. That the right went to a woman, but not to a man. There was never any legal arguments in that direction. And then when you get to that, you go, oh! So God knew that this abuse thing existed. Abuse was not a surprise to God. And that he took that into account in Old Testament law. And that, yes, God still hates divorce because the solution is you're supposed to do it right. And that you don't just dump someone for no reason, but you can not dump someone for a good reason. You can dump someone for not keeping their vows. You can dump someone for not being an adequate spouse. doesn't mean you have to leave, but it means you can leave. You know, oh, so we don't have to do God says, but we can just do God says. The God, yes, God says these things, but God also says these other things. And that these other things that so often get overlooked cover all of the things that become a problem if you just stop here. So if you just do this part and that part and you stop, you have all of these problems. But then you go look in the Old Testament law and go, oh, wait a second. This wasn't a surprise to God. God knew about this, not just 2,000 years ago. He knew about this 3,000 years ago, 3,500 years ago. 
he knew that sometimes stuff gets bad. And sometimes people need the right to leave. And he built that into the city. I go, whoa, that's pretty awesome. But how did I find that? Well, I treat the Bible as the Word of God. Therefore, my assumption is, unless something came into being after the completion of Scripture, meaning that it did not exist in that first century or earlier, that I will assume that God knew about it and in some way, shape, or form took that into account in his rules. So far... I have never found that to not be the case, so far. That in any area of Bible difficulty, I have been able to find an answer. And go, hmm. Well, to me, I think that's pretty cool. But it begins with, the Bible is the Word of God. I assume the Bible covered it. And it turns out I was right. We don't have to do God says but. We just do God says. But it also requires the Bible is the Word of God. Our interpretation of the Bible is not the Word of God. Because when you do that, you get say, God says, and you stop it. God says what we think He says. We've interpreted Scripture, and our interpretation of Scripture is the Word of God. So therefore, we don't look at that other thing, which then leaves us stuck with the God says, but. Well, I say you don't have to do God says, but. If the Bible is the word of God, God already took care of whatever the difficulty is. That there is an answer. Now, sometimes the answer may not be found in Scripture. Sometimes the answer may be found in just objective reality. Now, taking the Bible as the word of God allows for such things as rounding. So when it says that the, the circumference of the thing was three times its diameter, that's rounding. So, like, like what, because what is it? The circumference is the diameter times pi. Well, what's pi? Well, people say, well, it's 3.14. It's like, oh, it's not 3.14, also rounding? Well, 3.1415. Like, well, you're still rounding. Okay, 3.1415926535, okay, you're still rounding because pi is an infinite number. You can round it off to 3.14, which is what we typically do. We say, ah, it's close enough. You could round it off to 3.14159265535. You're still rounding it off. Depends how precise do you have to be. Could you round it just to three? I think you could. But as treating the Bible as the word of God, you start to run into some curious little things, like when you take the numerical value of the Hebrew numbers, or the Hebrew letters have a numerical value in addition to having a letter value, and when you take the numerical value of the Hebrew letters around the, the circumference of the, the sea, the, ba the giant basin, was three times its diameter, the numerical value of the letters in there is 22 over 7, which is also how we to this day round off pi as a fraction. That is 3 and 1 seventh. Isn't that amazing? But if you take the Bible as the Word of God, then you can stumble across these things. And you're going, oh, did God just round that off to three? Maybe he did. Would be totally legitimate to because, you know, all of our expressions are roundings, a pie. Or might there be some interesting thing tucked in there? Maybe there's an interesting thing tucked in And then we find stuff like 22 sevenths. Like, whoa, that's kind of freaky. Wonder if the Hebrew scribes who copied that knew that that was in there, or whether they just copy it because scripture is scripture, and you just copy the scripture. And so you get all of these interesting things in the Bible. Now, the Bible, being the word of God, also makes allowances for poetry. And so when it says that the eyes of the Lord went to and fro to throughout the earth. Does that mean there's, there's physical eyeballs somewhere flying around the planet Earth looking at stuff? Or is that a poetic idiom that means that God's looking at what's going on? Just like if I have a woman that I'm in love with, 
And when she walks in the room and she smiles at me, it's like, oh my gosh, you just light up my life. Okay, is that literally true? Was I dwelling in physical darkness until she walks in the smiles at Poof, let there be light. Oh, and suddenly there's physical light. And until then they can't see because everything's dark. Or is it a poetic statement meant to express my affection and my appreciation for that dazzling smile? We can say, oh, he's a liar. He said that her, she had a bright smile that lit up the room, and I checked the luminosity in the room, and it did not change when she smiled. He's a liar. Of course not. We make allowances for poetic language. And so same thing when we're dealing with scripture. We make allowances for poetic language. We make allowance for idioms. We make allowance for metaphors, just like we do with real human beings when we're talking to real human beings. We don't call someone a liar because they rounded off a number. We don't call someone a liar because they use an idiom. We don't call someone a liar because they express something with poetic language. And then some stories are expressed in kind of in this ambiguous way. Now, I treat biblical ambiguity as a design function of the Bible. That there are some things that there's just no, really no way for God to answer it. Not meaning that there is no answer and God doesn't know what it is, but there's no way for him to tell us what the answer is without us totally messing it up. So, for instance, what happens to the souls of an unborn child when an unborn child dies? Well, if the answer is the soul of an unborn child goes to hell, well, then we need to bomb every abortion clinic, kill every abortion doctor. We need to restrain every woman who might possibly go in for it because they're condemning millions and millions of babies to hell. But what if the opposite is true? What if they say, well, an innocent child, unborn, you know, it's hard to be more innocent than you know, you're not even born yet, automatically goes to heaven. Well, then what are you complaining about abortion for? We need to have tons of abortions. If you don't inherit original sin until you're at least born, well, then we need, we need to kill as many babies as we can before they're born. As so you see, it doesn't matter what the true answer is. There's no way for God to tell us the answer without that answer being wildly abused. Wildly abused. Not even just modestly abused. Wildly abused. There are some answers he just doesn't make clear. There are some things he might not explain because there's no reference point to understand it. So there's a ton of stuff in Scripture that God just declares, it's unclean. Stay away from it. It's just unclean. Looking at it with our 20th and 21st century scientific knowledge, we go, oh, so if you don't actually know how to properly prepare pork and how to properly store pork, you can get ringworm. There's parasite issues going on there. Oh! Well, for, you know, thousands of years, we had no idea. Just if, if you, you know, believe that part of Scripture, you just didn't eat pork. Why? God said don't eat pork. I don't know why. You just don't eat pork. It's a bone. Well, it looks like good meat to me. But then now we know, oh, don't eat shellfish. So like lobster is an abomination before God. But when you reflect on that and go, so if you don't know how to store and prepare lobster correctly, do you know that's incredibly unhealthy? It's probably not really super healthy anyway. But there was an age where lobster was a poor man's food because there was so much lobster where there was lobster and you couldn't transport it anywhere. If you didn't live within a few miles of the shore, you were never going to have lobster because you couldn't get it anywhere. If, if you lived in the Great Plains and you wanted lobster, well, tough. There was no way to ever get lobster to you for most of human history. And if you tried, you would probably get yourself sick, give yourself food poisoning, possibly die. And if you don't know how to store and prepare these things properly, they're really bad for you. But all God said back then was, unclean, don't do it. And if you're, you know, a good Jew, you should, you know, okay. Why? God said so. But why? I don't know. He just said it's unclean, so don't do it. And there's tons of that all through Scripture. Where he didn't explain, he didn't kind of explain, you know, viruses and bacteria and all of these things that were 
beginning to grasp and understand now. At least we think we grasp and understand now. He didn't explain all of that. He just, just, just stay away from it. Just stay away. And if you, you were a good Jew back in the day, you just kind of shrug, okay, all right, why? God, God said, don't need it, so we won't need it. God said, don't do it, so we won't do it. Why? It's unclean. And we recognize way, 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 thousands of years after the fact, like, oh, that, there was actually a really good reason for that. That, that. that rule makes a lot of sense. But for 3,000 years, it made no sense. You just did it because God said it. So there's a bunch of stuff in Scripture like that where there, there's no explanation. Well, you can even look at Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I take that as literally true. But when you start getting into the Genesis account, it's crafted poetically. So here gets to be an interesting thing. Genesis 1.1 is the true statement, and then it kicks into to all of this poetic expression. Is it poetically expressing the truth or is it a poetic explanation of a scientific truth that the people would not be able to understand if God was more literal? I mean, so, so what if the universe is four and a half billion years old? And you're going to try to explain a four and a half billion year old universe to a bunch of human beings in pre-Bronze Age world. Even just try to explain that number. I mean, think about it just in our case. What if I tell you, okay, four billion dollars. We go, wow, that's a lot of money. Okay, how much money is that? How, how much money would four billion dollars be in hundred dollar bills? How, how, how big would that be? How much space would that take up? And most of us, when we start to get more concrete, we kind of try to and we know that number. I mean, that's a number we use. We, we do math with that number. We, we've invented the number zero. We can, use, we can write that number out. We can do math with that number. But when I ask you to make it a concrete thing, how long is four billion seconds? How long is four billion minutes? We really don't know. We have a mathematical truth we understand, but when you start getting into the, the realities of it, we kind of go, oh, well, um, not really sure. I could probably figure it out. I could Google that. Like, okay, well, go back even 200 years. Try to figure that out. And so there's a bunch of stuff where it could be poetry to express in poetic form a fundamental truth found in Genesis 1.1, or it could be a poetic expression of a literal truth. If I stood before God and God told me it was literally true, I'd say, okay, I'm good with that. Makes sense to me. What if I stood before God and God told me that it was a poetic expression of a truth? Like when you say that her smile lights up the room, it was one of those. And so I, I was expressing poetically the 4.5 billion year reality of the coming into existence of the universe I created in poetic form at a level that could be understood by a you know, pre-enlightenment, pre-Renaissance mind. I'd train them. Okay, that makes sense to me. But the words are still the words. And they're still the right words. What they mean might be a slightly more open question. So in a lot of things in the Bible, back to reality is more important than anything I believe. I might believe in creation for sure, as I'm a creationist, and I might believe in more old earth creationism rather than young earth creationism. But I could be wrong. Now what if I stood before God and God said it was literally true and simultaneously a poetic expression? Now and I cock my head sideways and I go, huh? Like, well, you know the whole thing of E equals MC squared? That's correct. The linear time as measured is influenced by energy, mass, and distance. And when you factor in the entire mass of the known universe, 4.5 billion years equals six days. And I go, whoa. 
that's cool. And you're, okay, well that, that explains why it's all true. Now it is interesting that, uh, that uh, someone that has actually done those calculations and found that when you plug E equals MC squared with the known mass and the known energy and all, all, all the knowns in there, that the mass of the universe factored into calculating time ends up being six days for four, four and a half billion years. I find that fascinating. So then we go like, oh, so it was literally six days and literally 4.5 billion years at the same time. Go, whoa, that's pretty awesome. Just like you have this other weird thing in the Old Testament that destroys even the possibility of the Messiah coming. That Jesus Christ becomes impossible at a particular moment in Old Testament history. Because we know that the Messiah is to be the son of David, the king of the Jews. So he has to be of the royal line, right? Otherwise he can't be legally the king of the Jews. He has to be a son of David, the legal heir to David's throne. But then God puts a blood curse on the royal line. And the royal line gets a blood curse that says no one from the royal line will again sit on the throne of Israel. And go, now wait a second. So the Messiah has to be of the royal line, but then the royal line is cursed. So now the Messiah can't be of the royal line, but has to be of the royal line. Has to be a son of David, has to be the lawful king. I don't get it. It, it's messed up. When you read the genealogy of Jesus in the book of Matthew, it runs right through the blood curse line. That completely would disqualify Jesus of being the Messiah because he would inherit the blood curse through his father, Joseph. Go, oh, wait a minute. He's legally Joseph's son. But he's not biologically Joseph's son. Huh. So we get the blood curse ends with Joseph. So, but he still has to be a son of David. Does this mean like a legal son of David? Or, well, then you go to Luke and the genealogy in Luke. And that runs through Mary. That he's supposedly the son of Joseph, but he is the son of, and the, the, is the son of his Mary's father. And that goes back to David, not through Solomon, that's the royal line, but through another one of David's sons, Nathan. And I go, whoa! So the Messiah is the legal heir to the throne and skips the blood curse, but is still a son of David through his mother and one of David's other sons. Like, whoa! Total ninja god. Well, if you don't take the Bible... Literally, if you don't treat it as the word of God, there's no reason to hunt for stuff like that. You just kind of shrug and okay, well, you know, that's just one of those stupid fairy tale things that some person threw in that, that you know, then some editor left in there because they didn't really know how to build their patriarchal power dominated political power structure that they were trying to create and they just didn't know what they were doing. Or you get all these kind of weird things in scripture and they go, whoa, does God know what he's doing or what? And so you don't have to just throw scripture out. Instead, you gather all scripture up and say, these are the right words. I have a problem. Let's see if the answer is anywhere in these right words. Now, as I read scripture, then some people say, okay, well, if you're a, a conservative Christian, meaning that I believe the Bible is, is the right words, that if I believe the Bible is the word of God, I'm saying that the words in the Bible are the right words, the books in the Bible are the right books, so I got the right books with the right words and that they are the words I have to use. And I can't just throw some out and, and pick and choose the ones I want. I can't do the cafeteria thing. That means I need a system of interpretation that lets me solve all the problems. Well, the system of interpretation can't be the pick and choose because is that the principle I want to have applied by anybody on anything? Well, no. And that kind of fundamentally violates the Bible being the Word of God. So I go, okay, well, what's my number two core operating principle? All principles must be consistently applied. So whatever my principle is in one place in the Bible has to be the same principle I use every place in the Bible. 
And here is one of my fundamental principles. God was always looking to elevate humanity. If God was always looking to elevate humanity, then we look at God's laws, even when they seem archaic and even brutal by modern standards, and we compare it to what existed around it and what existed before it. Like back to the divorce issue. So that a woman was entitled to receive a certificate of divorce. You know, okay, well, you know, what's the big deal? You're, you're divorced or you're not divorced. I mean, that's all this piece of paper that says you're divorced. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is, by cultural law, back in the day, if a woman got married, and, and saying you know, her parents arranged a marriage, and then you know, and the people grew up, and they got married at you know, 13, 14, 15 years old, and then the husband decided, like, eh, and then he leaves. And so then she gets married to somebody else, and they have kids. The first husband had the legal right at any point in her entire life to come back and say, you know, I changed my mind, I want you back. And by the laws of the day, that first husband always had that right. Which also meant, if you were a second husband, at any moment in time, that first husband could show up and say, I want my wife back. She's mine. And, and, and then that was it. Done deal. You just lost your wife. So then, if you're a man, especially a man, that means, are you going to get married to a woman who has been divorced? Of course not. There's an innate risk in that. But a certificate of divorce, that ends the rights of that first husband. And in the certificate specifically, it and she may marry whomever she chooses. But the certificate of divorce did two things. One, it ended the first husband's rights, and so it elevated the woman's rights, diminished the man's rights, and it gave her the authority to make the decision on the second marriage. It removed the authority from the parents to make the decisions for her, and it ascribed agency to her. She, and she had this document to back it up. So the first husband shows up and says, well, I want my wife back. She says, nope, I've got my paper. Can't have me back. Second husband goes, she has her paper. You can't have her back. You know who else had a right to certificates of divorce in that era? Noble women. Royal women. Incredibly wealthy women of independent means. By God's law, every woman in Israel was treated as royal. You go, whoa, that's a serious elevation. And you get stuff like that happening all the time, like the, the rules of slavery. Slavery existed in every culture all over the world. But if you do it God's way, it was a completely different deal. That then you got the love slave. You had a seven-year trial period, and then both the slave and the master each had a choice. The slave could go, yeah, I like this deal. I'm going to stick around for it. And the master had to go, yeah, and you, know, you do good work, so I'm going to keep you on. And then the slavery could become permanent. You know, you know that would be a pretty decent deal. It also means that if you have a chance to be someone's slave or servant, he had a history. Like, when you show up at the household before, because you would typically sell yourself into slavery too, that when you, before you do that, you can say, okay, oh, he has a whole bunch of people he's had for a long time. All these people chose to stay. This must be a pretty good guy to work for. And then if you were the master, you had all these obligations. And so when you look at slavery, say, as we did it in the, the United States, southern states for a while, and you compare that to the law of the Old Testament law, you go, okay, those were two completely different deals. Imagine if every single slave that was brought over had the option to opt out of being that person's slave. They got to check out and say, well, what are the living conditions? What are the work conditions? How do you, how do you treat your people? And you go, Nope, not sticking around. I'm going to go find somebody else to be enslaved to. Might, might that have been a somewhat different deal? It might have been a somewhat different deal. Personally, I'm glad that we've kind of elevated beyond that, which is largely a convention of um, ongoing Judeo 
Christian thought as it continued to develop, particularly as we developed economic systems. And so you get all these interesting things where you go, whatever the surrounding rules were, God's rules were an upgrade. And so when you begin to look at stuff like that, you go, okay, so this rule might look bad, but in what way might it just be an upgrade? So there's an Old Testament law that says that if you have a disobedient child, you have a right to take that child before the council and basically prove up that, that your child is a rebellious, disobedient child and have your child stoned to death. That, that was allowed under the law. There isn't a single instance of it ever recorded of actually having happened, but I have a feeling a whole bunch of Jewish parents down over the ages probably threatened their kids with it. But here's the interesting thing. Before then, the head of the house had the authority to just kill their kid. And that was the rule in the surrounding cultures. If you ticked off your dad or your stepdad, <coughs> he had a right to kill you until this law. Then all of a sudden, parents no longer have a right to kill their kids. The man of the house no longer has a right to put someone to death and do an honor killing. Now the head of the house has to bring the kid before a council and has to prove up his case to a whole bunch of independent people. And that means if they, all, if they know that you're a jerk, no. 99% chance we should stone you, not the kid. You're the problem. It removed the authority to kill members of your family. Where and in a time and place where it existed in all the surrounding cultures. And we still see some you know, versions of that that still come down to us to this day. Where there's some places in the world where the head of the family or a senior male member of the family has a right to kill somebody for dishonoring the family. If you were Jewish, God took that right away from you 3,500 years ago. He said, nope, head of the house doesn't get to do that anymore. That is not in your authority. If you, if you think you have a case, you have to go prove it to somebody else. It elevated the safety of the children. You go, oh, well that's like backwards from what that looked like when I first looked at it. And so all through scripture, there's this constant thing of elevation, giving people more rights, more freedom, more authority, making people more responsible for making good decisions for themselves, and giving people the mandate to respect the rights and freedoms of other people. And so when I interpret scripture, that's what I look at. That's how I come to it. And I find, as I read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and, and I look at all the scripture and all of the potential problem passages with that simple assumption that because God is love, all the whole identity of God stuff I talked about last time, and I look at scripture through the lens of my perception of who God is, as these being the right books and the right words in the right books, I consistently see this theme which then also changes how I interact with what is required in the 21st century. Because if the theme is upgrade, 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 and someone's interpretation looks pretty solidly like a downgrade to me. But then when I look throughout all the scripture, God's main point is always you need to be better than the society around you. And you go, okay, so if the basic theme is always be better than the society around you, then I need to be better than the society around me. Now, will better than the society around me look the same in 21st century America as it did in the 1850s? Or is that going to be potentially different? Is being better than the societies around me going to look different in 1850 America than it would in 500 AD Europe? Is being better than the societies around me going to look different in uh, the Western world, first world country now than it did in the Roman Empire? Is it going to be different than it was 3,000 years ago? Yes, it's going to be different. 
but the principle will be consistently applied throughout of elevate, elevate, elevate. Be better than the society you're in. The society you're in is a baseline to start from. Be better than that. You know, oh, I can do that. Because being the same as society around me is the easy part, because I grew up in that society. Now, being better than the society around me, now that's going to require some personal growth. That's going to re require pursuing love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and you know, developing the fruit of the Spirit, developing a heart of love, developing greater maturity, greater insight, greater wisdom. Having a better relationship with my wife than society around me mandates. Oh, that means I need to love her and honor her and cherish her at a level above and beyond. That I don't get to use the idea, well, you're not allowed to divorce me, I can be as nasty to you as I want. And you go, okay, wait a second, God gave more rights to leave back then than that. So that, that's probably not the rule now. So I need to treat you in such a way so you wouldn't even want to leave. Why would you want to leave? Look at this awesome deal you have. And it's upgrade, 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 upgrade. And to me, that's totally awesome. And when I look at things and, and like, like afterlife stuff, heaven and hell, a lot of the translations of hell, if you're looking in the New Testament, you're talking Hades. Because it's in Greek, right? And we have other versions of them. We have Tartarus, and which was always the, the lowest part of Hades. That's where torture takes place. We have this Hades concept. In the Old Testament, we had Sheol, which is just the afterlife. And there was upper Sheol and lower Sheol. Basically, there's the good part of the afterlife and the not-so-good part of the afterlife. Upper Sheol was sometimes also referred to as Abraham's bosom. And so you get, kind of get these ideas going, okay, so maybe the heaven-hell dichotomy we like to talk about isn't quite the heaven-hell dichotomy that often we talk about. Because then if we say, okay, there's heaven, there's God's home, and, and that's laid out in New Testament, you know, living with God, mansions, streets of gold, all that. And then there's Hades. So you go, okay, well, what was Hades? Well, then we could just go, all right, well, we have, you know, Greek language, Roman Empire, what was their concept of Hades? And there's the Elysian Fields. There's, um, oh, I forgot the name of the middle part that is just like ennui. It's, it's like a purgatory. And then there's Tartarus, which is the place of punishment. The Hades concept essentially boiled down to you get whatever's fair. So what if the deal then with God is either you get whatever's fair or you get the totally unfair family deal. Because nobody deserves a family deal. It's not fair that anyone would get offered the family deal if you're not a member of the family. To which God says, that's cool. You want to be adopted in the family? I'll adopt you. All you have to do is say yes. The offer stands. But if you don't say yes, or you don't ever have the opportunity to say yes, well, you get the totally fair deal. It's totally fair. And that a loving God will give you a totally fair deal, or that exact same loving God will give you the family special. So you can choose totally fair, or you can choose family special. I chose the family special. I like the family special. I think the family deal's a good deal. If I've been invited to the throne of God, and he says, Here, here's the deal. I'll be your father. I'll adopt you. You'll be a joint heir. You can enter my courts with thanksgiving on your heart. Or enter my, ga or my gates with thanksgiving on your heart and enter my courts with praise. You can come boldly before me because now you are one of my children. And then you get to live in my home forever. And I've got some pretty good, awesome things going on here for family. Now, when I look at scripture, does, does that also sound consistent with that all principles must be consistently applied upgrade thing? That there's a, just an upgrade. There's not a downgrade. So if there used to be an upper Sheol and a lower Sheol, and then Hades was an upper, middle, and lower, would God be upgrading or downgrading? It would seem to me, based upon the entire arc of biblical history, God's always in the upgrade business. God's always in the more love business, not the less love business. He's in the less judgment business, not the more judgment business. And you go, oh, 
Huh. Huh. So when I read scripture, that's my basic approach. The Bible is the undisputed primary source material for Christianity. When I go into it, I take my other principles with me. Reality is more important than anything I believe. That means I never assume that I know everything. I never assume that I'm exactly right in what I do know. But I have a reality that there are books in this Bible and there are words in those books. And if I'm going to determine what I keep and what I throw out, I must follow number two. All principles must be consistently applied. And if I'm allowed, you're allowed. If I'm allowed, you're allowed. Everyone's allowed. And on what basis? On whatever basis I'm doing it, I'm giving universal permission for all people in all faiths, anywhere in the world, at all times in history, to do exactly the same thing. So if I just say the words are the words, the books are the books, then I'm saying that for all of us who are Christians, we have to treat the words like the words and the books as the books. And if I say, well, the words are the words, but they may not mean what you think they mean. What I'm telling everyone is all of us, you have a right to disagree with me just like I have a right to disagree with you. I think you should be okay if I disagree with you so long as my interpretation lets the words be the words and the books be the books. Well, then it also means I should be okay with you so long as your interpretation lets the words be the words and the books be the books. And so on and so on and so on. So that's how I personally approach the Bible without you know, doing breakout Bible studies in the Greek and the Hebrew and stuff. And there's, there's tons of interesting things in the Bible. And the more you treat the words of the words and the books of the books and you just dive into this, these sometimes bizarre things like the ninja god cursing the bloodline and then doing the end run around the bloodline and using the bloodline, you go, whoa, pretty cool stuff. Like, well, what's the certificate of the divorce deal? Go, oh, royal women got that? Whoa. Want to know how much authority women had uh, in uh, the ancient times? When Esther went before her own husband, the king, if he doesn't hold out the scepter and acknowledge her presence in a positive way, she could be put to death for just trying to have an audience with her own husband. That kind of gives you an idea what the, the surrounding rules were like. If you're a Jewish woman, you had the right to go before your head of state. The widow before Solomon. Or, 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 let's, or the, the mothers before Solomon. The widow before David. The three sisters before Moses. You go, that is a lot of right that didn't exist in the surrounding cultures. So many amazing things. But I find those, and I, I find them fascinating because I treat... The Bible is the Word of God. I also treat my interpretation of the Bible as not the Word of God. Nobody's interpretation of the Bible is the Word of God. Also means I hold a lot of my interpretations loosely. Meaning I assume that I'm right, which is why I hold the thing, but I hold loosely enough because I may not be right. How do I know that? Because all principles must be consistently applied. I need other people to hold their stuff loosely enough to be open to new information, right? Otherwise, why would I even bother talking to them if no one's ever going to budge? And that means I have to be willing to budge. Golden Rule 101 again. And it also means there's a lot of places where if this is kind of my conclusion, I'm not really sure. Could be totally different. I hold it very loosely in that case. But whatever the interpretation is, has to let the words be the words and the books be the books. And that's how I approach that. Because that's, reality is more important than anything I believe. All principles must be consistently applied walking in the scripture, which is, the Bible is the undisputed primary source material for Christians, for Christianity. I'm a Christian. I'm a member of Christianity. Therefore, it is my primary source material. And as my primary source, it is the Word of God. As my primary source, the Bible is the Word of God, but our interpretation of the Bible is not the Word of God, and I see a consistent theme of upgrade, 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 always aimed at greater and higher levels of love and honor of people.